So you've got on your handout, Sarah, a uh, thing about understanding investigations and iron studies. Um, obviously, iron markers, are, or iron markers are biological markers which are present in various stages of iron metabolism. And they can be looked at in various ways, but as we keep mentioning, the ferritin, the transfer and saturation, the two common things that we can measure, we can't easily measure the transfer and receptors. You can in the, some of the teaching hospitals, but again, the value of those is a little bit iffy, and we will discuss that. Uh, the red cell indices are quite obviously good for determining whether someone has iron deficiency, but in the context of early iron deficiency, the red cell indices may be normal. And hepcidin, which I mentioned earlier, is also an issue because we can't actually measure it, so we keep talking about it, however. Um, so there's a normal range for these biological markers. Um, ferritin, that sort of range. The ranges you find in the private or all the labs can vary a, a bit and um, it's, and whether they give any interpretation of the meaning of those um, results is also variable and whether their interpretation is the real correct interpretation is another issue and that's a problem we are living with at the moment or trying to sort out. So the ferritin is specific for iron deficiency, so there is only one reason for having a low, very low ferritin, and that is iron deficiency. Um, but the disadvantage, as it says, is it increases with inflammation and chronic renal failure and all the inflammatory cytokines and the, when hepcidin is increased. Transferrin saturation is a mathematical um, assessment between the serum iron, for which we should, as we've heard, do in a fasting state, and the transferrin, which is the iron binding protein. And that has a range of something like 20 to 45 percent. It's fairly easy to obtain. And again, there's, and it's a good indicator that if it is less than 20 percent, that it means that there is a functioning iron deficiency in terms of getting iron into the red cells. So although the patient may have iron in the stores and in the bone marrow, it can indicate whether there is both functional and absolute iron deficiency. <coughs> um, transference receptors I've mentioned, it can be useful. Transferrin receptors actually increase when there is an increase in turnover of red cells in the bone marrow. And that can occur in a number of indications, but usually not in chronic inflammation. Um, hypo means hypochromic red cells. Usually in a peripheral blood smear or count, you get less than 5% hypochromic red cells if there's an increase above then, it suggests that there may be some cause for a microcytosis, microcytic anemia. I'll mention that later. And there's another thing that we can measure, CHR actually stands for reticulocyte hemoglobin, some of the new machines that do blood counts can measure that. And you can imagine that you're, as you have uh, iron is replete in someone who's iron deficient, the reticulocytes which start coming up as a result of the increased iron availability. They rise in number, but also their hemoglobin increases as well. So that presages, if you like, the rise in the red cell hemoglobin. And hepcidin, as I've mentioned, we have levels there, but we can't measure it. So what is ferritin? Um, we glibly talk about all these things, but until you actually look it up on wiki, you don't really know what ferritin is. Um, it's basically a storage protein which uh, can tr keeps iron within a, a sort of this globular um, protein <coughs> matrix and releases it in a cold fashion. It's a sort of buffer against iron deficiency. If the blood has too little iron, ferritin can release more. You can get more from the ferritin. 
And if there's too much iron going into the blood and into the tissues, then ferritin can mop it up. Um, to release the iron when the body needs it, the ferritin must the iron within the ferritin must be changed from ferric to ferrous, and the iron leaves these little channels in that protein matrix. So it's a, a sort of an interesting structure to allow a protein to <coughs> store and release iron in a controlled fashion. And that's all I'm going to say about the function of ferritin. If we actually consider iron metabolism and the tests that we are using, and I'm sorry, I put this in uh, since I'd done that handout. It's at the end of some of the other areas. But if you look at the um, various iron compartments, you can see that in the um, in terms of assessing where we are with the state of our iron metabolism, whether we're deficient or what, we've got a variety of tests which kind of relate to these various areas. So the top there, you've got hyper and CHR, which is obviously something you can measure in the circulating red cells. Uh, down there, you've got the ferritin, which is a storage in the liver and in the macrophages of the bone marrow. So that's where, we, uh, where ferritin fits in. The plasma fits in into the transferrin and the serum ion and therefore the transferrin saturation. And the serum and the transferrin receptors, the soluble transferrin receptors, are something that comes out of the erythroid cells and the bone marrow. So each of these tests sort of indicates some aspect, pathological or otherwise aspect, relating to these various parts of the all these various iron compartments of iron metabolism. So if we're looking, therefore, at the storage iron, the serum ferritin, we've got ferritin, which is uh, heavily in the liver and in the macrophages and the bone marrow. And we know that if you have liver disease, and liver inflammation, your ferritin may be way up. Um, we just had a, a registrar was telling me yesterday how someone came into the hospital and got quite severe liver disease and the ferritin's 13,000. Is there anything we can do about it? Well, so cure the liver disease, we can't do anything about the ferritin. The ferritin is the result of the liver inflammation, the breakdown of liver cells and uh, releasing ferritin. So when we look at the serum ferritin, it um, represents iron stores, as I said, in the macrophages, the marrow and the hepatocytes. And a low ferritin is diagnostic of um, iron deficiency. The normal range varies with age and sex, as you would imagine. I mean, in the graph there, you can see the female range is lower, then rises up post-menopause, and the male range is higher throughout life except in puberty. So an elevated ferritin, as we've mentioned, I know we keep reiterating some of these things. Sorry, there is some crossover and, uh, between us. But inflammation does cause that raised serum ferritin. And all those things there, renal failure, diabetes, etc., can contribute towards the raised ferritin. So it then makes it very difficult to know, is that patient iron deficient or not? So the transferrin saturation, percent plasma transferrin bound to iron, Transferrin contains two iron binding domains, as you can read there. The extracellular environment, the plasma, has a pH of around 7.4. And that transferrin molecule, which is of where it says transferrin in red, um, by when there is no iron, ferric iron bound to that, um, there is very little um, take up, there's little affinity of that transferrin molecule for the transferrin receptor with the transferrin receptor on the bottom and the, um, the sorry, the, the transferrin receptors on the, on the cell membranes. So that's where that is. 
So when the transferrin is bound to one or two of or two lots of iron molecules, then there is great avidity for that transferrin receptor. And the transferrin receptor binds to the mole the sorry, the transferrin and the iron bind to the transferrin receptor at a pH of around 7.4 in the plasma, and then get um, taken into the cell in a little um, globule, and then the iron is actually released from that um, endocytic um, globule at a low pH of around 5.5, so you have to have a low pH to release the iron into the cell. That's probably better represented here where um, you can see the diferic transferrin on the surface at the top left there goes into this uh, membrane-coated vesicle, uh, very low pH, 5.5, releases iron into the cell. And then the transferrin, sorry, the receptor then goes back to the surface and can be released. So you can imagine that if you have a lot of red cells turning over very rapidly, the transferrin receptor, um, the soluble aspects of the transferrin receptor can be released into the circulation. And that's an indicator actually of iron deficiency, even in, this, in the state of chronic inflammation. Um, so just talking roughly about the plasma ion and the transferrin saturation, that's plasma. Um, what I'm just trying to represent here is the left there is these little uh, pink oval things or, which represent iron. The iron goes into the macrophages of the bone marrow and the liver and then gets passed into the plasma as a transferrin as complex with transferrin, which is that little bar, to around 30% and then taken up by the marrow, by the red cells in the marrow. Um, so in tran the transferrin saturation in iron deficiency, if you go to the top there, there's those little red bars that get a little oval very little goes into the iron stores and very little goes out into the transferrin binding so that green bar at the top there is very low so there's a relatively small amount of um, iron going into the pink red cells of the bone marrow if you like so in cancer and inflammation you get a lot of iron going into those macrophages but you can see on the um, I don't know if I have a pointer. No, I'll just use one thing. So in the um, infl in inflammation, you get the iron going in there. The, um, it goes into the iron storage macrophages in the bone marrow, but it's prevented from going out. So you get a very low transferrin um, iron binding capacity, so the patient actually ends up having very little in the way of iron going into the red cells, so functionally iron deficient. Another cause for actual functional iron deficiency is when you give erythropoietin therapy and the iron goes into the macrophages again, does come out and goes, comes out in a big way because of that push from the erythropoietin, but the, probably there's less iron than is needed for the stimulation of the red cells. So the red cells are actually become deficient because they just lack a, enough iron that, to be pushed into them by the erythropoietin. So just to summarize there, the transferrin saturation is very useful. The normal level is around 35% in iron deficiency around 5%, it's very low the transferrin binding to iron. In infections, a little bit higher, but it's still usually low. In situations where you have a breakdown of red cells, such as hemolytic anemia, often there is iron released into the circulation, so the transferrin actually takes it up, so the transferrin saturation may be quite high. And in ineffective erythropoiesis, where the red cells are just not being produced at all in the liver, there may be um, 
quite a high red cell, um, sorry, quite a high transferrin saturation because the iron is just hanging around in the plasma. It's not being taken up. And in iron overload, the um, transferrin saturation may be extremely high as well. Um, so what does STFRS stand for? Soluble transferrin receptors. Um, the transferrin receptor is a transmembrane disulfide linked dimer of identical polypeptides anyway. So it's this, as you saw in the previous slides there, a, a receptor on the surface of the red cells, and it's involved in actually taking up iron from the transferrin, which um, gives it into, onto the receptor, gives iron onto the receptor. So when the iron goes in there, um, it, uh, as I said, gets sort of interiorized into the cells and then the transferring receptor goes back to the surface again and part of it can be released into the plasma. So this is true when it says there's no reliable laboratory test to identify iron deficiency in patients with chronic disease. Soluble transferrin receptor can be useful, but it's not definitive. So the serum or plasma transferrin receptor is elevated by iron deficiency in patients with or without chronic disease, but it's not affected by chronic disease in the absence of iron deficiency. So um, in chronic disease, your soluble transferrin receptor doesn't rise. <coughs> In published clinical trials, it's demonstrated that elevated trans soluble transferrin receptor was highly correlated with the absence of iron in a marrow aspirate, which is the gold standard. So yes, you have a high soluble transferrin receptor when there is iron deficiency. Um, and that would just tells us that we're dealing with the erythroid aspects of the marrow at the moment. So if we come to the measurement of transferrin receptor, it's high when there is what's known as hyperplastic erythropoiesis, anything which promotes the high turnover of red cells in the marrow, and that iron deficiency is one of those. But also things like autoimmune hemolytic anemia and any of those hemolytic anemias, hereditary spherocytosis, thalassemia, HBH disease, and, and polycythemia might cause a high turnover. So anything that has a high turnover causes an increase in the soluble transferrin receptor. We tried to figure out whether it was of any value to us. You don't have this on your handout, but uh, this was an abstract poster presentation at a meeting we did. We found that the soluble transferrin receptor was great for determining that there was iron deficiency, which we already knew, and also, um, certainly in some patients where the ferritin was kind of just low normal. But we found that in patients who were not really, who were not truly iron deficient in the basis of the bone marrow, because this was a comparison of bone marrow versus blood soluble transferrin receptor versus iron stores, we found that in hematological malignancy where there's often quite a common high turnover of some sort of abnormal malignant cells that you've got a false positive. Anyway, I won't dwell on that. Um, the other aspect of more easily, that we can assess more easily by looking at uh, red cell printouts, MCV, MCH, etc on the circulating red cells is um, what we have spoken about as the hypochromic red cells and the reticulocyte hemoglobin. So this is just, again, a very hypochromic, microcytic-looking blood film. And in general, in a normal patient, you would not expect to have more than 5% hypochromic red cells. Unfortunately, what the printouts you get from the labs do not actually demonstrate the number of hypochromic red cells. All you get is the MCV and the MCH, which is obviously a, a mean of the overall numbers of uh, 
hemoglobin and size of the red cells. But if you were able to get an assessment on a bell curve as the number of patients that had, sorry, of the number of hypochromic red cells in a, any patient, you would find out that certainly in iron deficiency and other causes of microcytosis, that would be quite increased and certainly above the 5% level. So in treated iron deficiency, you often get, um, well, you don't often get, but you always would get a population of cells which have been around and are hypochromic, and then you would get a population of cells which have been normally hemoglobinized. So you get this sort of what we call a dimorphic blood film. And that can be, I'll go back to that in a moment, but just coming to the hemoglobin content of reticular sites, the, um, for example, a top graph there is iron deficiency anemia then treated with intravenous iron. You can see that the, um, it's the days on the bottom and the numbers of cells on the side, that the, the red, small red population there is the, number, is the reticular site population. And you can see that as you've given the intravenous iron, that reticular site population becomes larger and the amount of hemoglobin in that reticular site population increases. So again, this is a test that can be done on some of the machines that are available in the labs, but is not reported on routinely. Um, so hepcidin, um, just coming on to hepcidin, is, uh, I don't have a picture of the structure of hepcidin, but you can see where it works, that um, if you've got a chronic inflammatory process, um, it prevents liver giving up iron to the plasma, can, prevents the macrophages giving up iron to the plasma, and it reduces intestinal absorption, although this iron goes into the endoluminal cells of the duodenum, but can't get out of it, as we saw last, in the last presentation. Um, so people have measured hepcidin, and they, it really does exist, apparently. It's um, in situations where there's a raised CRP, like the second bar long, the hepcidin level can be very high, and um, in various other chronic diseases like multiple myeloma, renal disease, pediatric and adult renal disease, it's uh, significantly increased. I think we are actually on the verge of getting hepcidin. Um, I know various people at Frio and at UWA have been working on assays, um, and I'm just so surprised that the pharmaceutical companies or the diagnostic companies haven't got an assay yet because I'm sure it would make a lot of money. Um, so just coming back to that concept, which you, this is where we started off at, just regarding the, um, each of these components, the red cells, the macrophages, the plasma, have the erythroid marrow, each has their own type of test you can look at to ass help assess iron um, status of the patient. Um, iron deficiency, I just want to labor this issue again, absolute versus functional. We looked at those things on cancer before. Absolute means no iron stores, low hepcidin, ferritin, certainly less than 100, probably less than that. In functional iron stores, functional iron deficiency, you have plenty of iron. On the gold standard test, which is the bone marrow biopsy and staining for iron in the macrophages, hepcidin's high, ferritin's high. Both of those end, may end up, though, having a low transferrin saturation increased hypochromic red cells and in, um, reduced particular site hemoglobin, and, they, and then both go on to develop anemia. <coughs> so the application of EPO in cancer, I'm just trying to demonstrate here that on the left, if I go over there, you can't hear me through this, so I'll just stay here. Um, but those little red um, ovals indicate the iron going into the 
big oval thing with the green, which is the macrophages and the bone marrow. And if you've got a cancer or inflammation, those two little red bars indicate you can't get much iron out into the transferrin and into the bone marrow, the FID, the pink bone marrow. But when you're giving EPO, um, you can push that iron through into the red cells. So giving EPO is, can be useful. And <coughs> even more useful can be giving EPO plus IV iron in functional iron deficiency associated with chronic inflammation or cancer. Um, the combination on the top diagrams there is uh, the, the yellow green bar is EPO and the iron is the red and it's being, you can see there's the two bars there which means that the iron is not easily getting out but with the EPO and in fact with intravenous iron you can push the iron through into the developing red cells. So how to approach the diagnosis and the management of anemia in a patient referred for surgery? Um, so we have a, obviously a clinical assessments very important. The history, as Trudy's mentioned, and the examination, and all the laboratory investigations. Um, tiredness and fatigue, GI tract symptoms and signs, menorrhagia, cardiac disease, hematuria, hemoglobinuria, all the things you need to assess when you're trying to look at causes of iron deficiency and causes of anemia. Um, on the examination, there's the issue of pallor, coelonychia, cardiac murmurs, high flow murmurs in patients who are anemic, abdominal masses. Uh, very important, obviously, in people who are anemic and iron deficient, that you do lay your hand on the abdomen to see if there's any big masses there. Uh, sometimes splenomegaly may be of, of value because uh, portal hypertension and issues regarding um, varices may contribute to iron deficiency. And telangic, telang telangic tases. So this is a guy who's got hereditary hemorrhagic telangic tases and um, he bleeds intermittently from his, throughout his bowel. Um, obviously a fairly rare disorder, this, but um, unless you think about it as a possible cause of iron deficiency, you may miss it. And I've got patients who just come in and have intravenous iron virtually monthly because, or even more frequently because they just continuously lose blood from their dysplastic and angi angiotic sort of lesions throughout the GI tract. You don't even worry about those patients in terms of of sort of regularly investigating or anything. I mean, they get iron deficient. Their hemoglobin may, this particular lady I'm thinking of, within a month their hemoglobin may go down from 12 to 5. And in fact, we often give intravenous iron every two weeks. So sometimes it's just intravenous iron is the way to go. And we don't like blood. Um, but often patients who are first thing, they go into an emergency department, they have a hemoglobin of 50, and the first thing they get is a whack of blood, which is transfused blood, which is not always the best approach. What we've actually done at Fremantle, we've often, patients have been coming into the emergency department with um, severe anemia, which on assessment is clearly microcytic, and in order to get things sorted out rapidly and in order to avoid just giving transfusions we've sort of fast tracked the iron studies so the iron studies can be got out from biochemistry within about 20 to 30 minutes of the blood being taken and then if they're iron deficient then they get iron not blood um, obviously unless they've got some sort of um, uh, problem with their uh, cardiac failure or, the, or they've got systemic, severe systemic symptoms, they may need a bag of blood or two. But I've seen more people die from over-transfusion than they ever have from under-transfusion. So I think it's important to consider that we don't have a default mechanism of just the administration of blood in anemia. Um, 
Microcytic anemias, MCV less than 77, can be due to iron deficiency, thalassemia, chronic disease, and other rare causes. Um, macrocytic, greater than 100, maybe megaloblastic, non-megaloblastic, and the normocytic, where you've got bone marrow failure, maybe hemolysis. So in microcytic anemias, with a low MCV and a low MCH, you're <coughs> clearly iron deficiency is the main thing, but you have to make sure you're not missing a thalassemia tray. There's more and more people coming in from Mediterranean, Middle East, Africa, with um, these thalassemia and other hemoglobinopathies, which you need to be aware of. Chronic disease, as I've mentioned. Chronic disease, you don't usually get such a low MCV and MCH as you might do in iron deficiency. But other hereditary forms of disorder, sideroblastic anemia, or that can be part of myelodysplasia as well. So, um, and lead poisoning, hopefully we don't see too much of that around at the moment. Um, so the commonest cause of anemia worldwide is dietary, um, sorry, the commonest cause of anemia worldwide is iron deficiency, probably and many of those are dietary parasites, blood loss, malabsorption. And colleagues who've been over to Western Africa and various other places in Africa and Southeast Asia say, um, and certainly to East Africa, there seems to be a vogue or was a vogue for giving patients with anemia blood transfusion where virtually all of them are iron deficient from parasites and whatever. So um, there was a presentation done at the East African Congress of, uh, of surgeons, I think, about all this, about administration of iron rather than transfusion. And clearly, in, probably in Africa is the place that you would not want to get transfused. So the transferrin receptors and marrow iron stores are generally reserved for difficult cases of assessment of iron status. In iron deficiency, um, I guess the clinical clues might be youngish person with thrombocytosis. This, I'll go on to the RDW, but a high RDW in the blood film with ellipticites and pencil cells and target cells. And we've spoken about the treatment and investigation. And clearly, you do not want to leave any stone unturned in terms of assessing whether people possibly might have some sort of um, GI tract malignancy. So a typical case of iron deficiency, hemoglobin 86, MCV is low, MCH is low, red cell count is also low. Platelets may be raised a little bit. The erythropoietin stimulus to um, the marrow as a result of the anemia sometimes turns on the um, platelet production as well. And occasionally the red cells might be, the white cells may be increased. The ferritin is obviously low and the transferrin saturation low. Again, you've seen that before, hypochromic microcytic red cells and partially treated. And I said I'd come on to the red cell distribution width, and that is something that you get out on the um, blood count results, sort of. And you will find that it's the RDW red cell distribution width is a coefficient of variation of volume. In other words, it's a bell curve which um, shows the variation, the volume of the red cells, in the, the volume or the size of the red cells. So it may differentiate an anemia of mixed causes from an anemia of a single cause. So if you just have a particular anemia with only where all the cells are the same size, say, in hereditary serocytosis or something, the, um, the, the RDW may actually be normal. But in a patient who's got hypochromic red cells, as in that top graph, again, um, the, the bell curve is normal. Um, but the distribution width, the width there may be a little increased. But if, you've, if you then transfuse or do this post-intravenous iron where you've got a diff several different populations of red cells, you can see that you've got that um, 
double peak, which is a sort of extreme form of, of the red cell distribution width, and the actual distribution is quite significantly increased from, if you look at the top there, at the bottom, RDW is 24 to 44. So another, as I was talking about thalassemia, um, clues obviously, this is microcytic anemia again, a clue, racial origin, microcytic red cells, target cells, and it, to all intents and purposes it may look like a iron deficiency, but um, there is a lowish haemoglobin, but in iron deficiency the red cell count tends to go down commensurate with the reduction in haemoglobin. Whereas in, say, thalassemia tray, the red cell count tends to be pushed up. So the red cell count is disproportionately high. And also the um, MCV and the red cell distribution width may be disproportionately low. So the haemoglobin may not look too bad, but you'll get some startling figures on the red cell count and the MCV and the MCH and the RDW. So and you might go along and do iron studies and you find that they're fine, basically. There was, some years ago, I mean, people seem to not be aware of the fact that thalassemia minor was a... Uh, you could have thalassemia minor and those microcytic changes with normal iron stores. And you had a few patients being put on regular iron and then they get iron overloaded is not a very good thing. So they, these patients do not need iron, they're just as they are and there's nothing you can do about it short of giving them a new bone marrow. Um, just a blood film of someone with beta thalassemia tray, which we've really mentioned already. So in a macrocytic anemia, um, the MCV, the higher it is, the more likely, likely you are to have a B12 or folate deficiency, certainly above 110. <laughs> except in patients who are being treated with um, hydroxyurea for a myeloproliferative disorder. You may have patients who are coming in seeing hematologists and being put on hydroxyurea, and that gives you a very high, maybe up to 120 level MCV. Um, causes of megaloblastic change is um, made variable um, in megalo megaloblastic B12 or folate deficiency, you may get cytopenias, hypersegmented neutrophils. So in, there's a distinction between B12 and folate, and I won't go into those at the moment. Um, pictures of patients with megaloblastic anemia, you see that on the right, they're nice hyper, hyperlobulated or hypersegmented neutrophil, and the red cells are a little bit large and oval. Non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia is usually obvious from the history, alcohol, liver disease, thyroid disease, chemotherapy, and MDS is quite a, quite a common finding in um, patients with just mild macrocytosis, around 105, say. So I have to rush on, I think. There's just some pictures of patients with macrocytes and hypersegmented neutrophils. Um, I think Trudy has mentioned essentially the preoperative management. I think that's going to be discussed later, so I won't labour this, but we do have preoperative <coughs> GP management algorithms which were um, we got going at Fremantle Hospital, and they're on your printouts there, and there's the recommended screening to accompany GP referrals, and um, what to do if various ferritin cutoffs. Be happy to answer any questions on this afterwards. Um, so in the end, the iron levels that assist in distinguishing distinguishing between iron deficiency anemia and anemia of inflammation are really the bottom line is the serum iron, the transferrin, the, uh, that is the transferrin saturation, and the serum ferritin. 
and the CRP, all the rest of those um, things are kind of more on the academic side and you can't easily um, get them studied at the present time. But if you do have patients who you are concerned about, whether they really are iron deficient or whether they've got anemia of chronic disease as well as iron deficiency, then certainly uh, consider or discussion with a hematologist might be worthwhile or because a bone marrow, quick bone marrow aspirate, a relatively painless way of doing it is with a spinal needle and you get out some um, of the bone marrow and you can stain it for iron. If there's iron there, then okay, the patient does have iron stores, so it's not by definition iron deficient. Thank you.